friends and families around the world and welcome to another edition of our kids play hockey our guest today is christy's sister it's Teresa marzek <laughs> Teresa lives in so new york and she's a doctor of physical therapy with 42 years of experience from across the country she and her husband have two grown children who both played hockey her daughter michelle is also currently serves in the u.s navy and plays for their rec team Teresa is also a level four hockey coach and still plays recreationally in her hometown on a team called the nightmares Teresa, welcome to the show Thank you. So first question, the obvious question, tell us how your hockey journey began. Tell us how you got involved. Tell us about your kids. Tell us about everything you when it comes to hockey. Um, when I lived in Patterson, New York, the, uh, there was a little girl across the street from us and she invited my daughter to play hockey in Pauling. Pauling, you've heard of Pauling of hockey team. Yeah. yeah so, um, Got her started with that. And then my son said, I want to play hockey too. And, but I want to be a goalie. And she wanted to be the defenseman. So she, they both were 18 months apart so they could play on the same team for many years. And um, this is a very common I, story. I, <laughs> I was um, involved with the, uh, the uh, teams and they found out that I was, well, I let them know I was a physical therapist. So when there was an injury, they would call on me to evaluate the, uh, the uh, child or the adult. A lot of adults got hurt. And, um, and then that's where I came. Uh, I got involved with starting to do learn to play hockey and I learned how to play. And from that, I started to coach and then I got into the coaching and then made my way up to a level four. And um, eventually I started a little woman's team. It was called Mom's Hockey. Because when the, the kids, uh, the end of February, the kids would stop playing hockey because March 1st, the spring sports started. And the ice arena that I was at had a lot of open ice. So they let me uh, buy the ice and I could have a good time that moms could come and play hockey. Because it was, you, you had to figure out uh, when when a good time would be that the husband or their significant other would watch the kids so they could come to the arena for an hour and I was able to do that we started mom's hockey and uh, from that it turned into the women's hockey team and you know, I think what's really interesting is we did not grow up around hockey huh? well my dad made an ice arena in the backyard yeah, yeah. so you skate we skate but not not real hockey no, team. Not we hockey. were never involved with hockey. Football, basketball was really track. Big in our, track mm -hmm. was big in our our um, communities, mm -hmm. but hockey really wasn't in our lives growing up, other than just the backyard rink. So it's it's kind of fun to see how, as we got older, yeah. We, and then I, because my <laughs> kids played hockey, her kids started <laughs> playing hockey, and then from there it went into where she evolved into a book. Yeah, uh, from I mean, there, we, oh, when we really got weird. introduced to hockey, we met full in. We were all yeah. in. Yeah, we were yeah. all in. No, I love yeah, it. I dragged her kids to <laughs> clinics and they started. And yeah, but I love it though. I mean, it has given us so it's many fun. rewards. It's it is so fun. fun. Yeah, you know, and the fact that she's a level four coach now, that is so impressive. I mean, she took it to another level, another level, four levels. <laughs> it's amazing. We're, we're going to get there. I, I think it's funny. You said my kids play hockey, her kids play hockey. And now our <laughs> play hockey. That's a plug for the show, obviously. I know. Yeah. Teresa, it's, it's an amazing story. One is, the, you know, obviously you're, you have a family of trailblazers over there in the uh, yeah. household, but everybody's going up to do amazing. It, we went to Toronto a lot, uh, Mississauga, yeah. uh, to um, the, uh, what was it? Elgin, Elgin goalie camp. Goal, it? I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 We went there and that was the best goalie camp ever. And I would watch in the stand and write down everything I saw for, for uh, drills and bring them back home and make the goalies do that. And any of the, the camps I took my kids at, I would sit there and just write down everything and then bring it back. So I learned a lot in Canada. Well, let me ask you this, because I want to dive into your coaching experience in a little bit. Again, we're talking with two women here who uh, broke through brick walls 
uh, in, in their perspective fields, whether it's physical therapy, whether it's coaching, whether it's being a TV news anchor. Uh, but a level four coach, you told us a little bit before the episode started, you were the only woman in the class. Why don't you walk us yes. through your coaching journey uh, and how that's affected your life? And a little later in the episode, we're definitely going to get into PST stuff because I know we have uh, people listening that want to know a lot about that when it comes to injuries and making sure their kids are safe. But we have to ask about the coaching first because this is an amazing. I know. Well, well, I ended up being on the bench with the kids because of the injuries. And for me to be on the bench, I had to get a coaching certification. Um, so I started off with a level one and that was my in. And then I, I pretty much um, looked at the first aid kits that they had and they were meager, meager. So I had to up the ante on that to be better prepared for, I mean, they're, they're, could be horrific. There were horrific injuries on the ice. And if you were better prepared, um, you could minimize the damage. So from there, I just went to level two because it was required. Right. It's required by USA Hockey that everyone get to a level four. So I just went through the motions and I did it. And um, then I could coach on any level. I could be at any level bench. I pretty much stayed at the JV high school level. I never went to varsity level, um, but the travel teams, uh, they used me. Um, if there was an injury, I would go into the locker room immediately. And I could because I, I had my uh, background checks. You know, it's, it's important that they, you, you have that background check so they know that the parents know that you're safe being with their child, especially with me, that I'm going to do a, a physical exam on them and to see if they needed to go to the emergency room or if it was something that was minor and I could take care of it and um, diagnose the problem um, and go on from there. But, uh, you know, you, like I said, USA Hockey required that you went to a level four. But so, when you went to Lake Placid to get your certification. I know, I was the odd duck. <laughs> I was such an odd duck there. And um, <laughs> when the... <laughs> When they, they didn't realize that I was a woman and they put me down, like I told you, as Terry Marzak. <laughs> and you everybody had to share rooms. So I went into the room and I was unpacking and these two men came in to share the room with me. And they go, wow, USA Hockey's really gotten liberal. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, You're not right. staying with me. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> we marched down and they had a good laugh about that. But... I had to sit up front, you know, I sat right up front at Lake Placid and, you know, yeah. had all these men with all these comments in the back. I'm like, okay, 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 guys, you know, watch your language. And they did. They were very <laughs> respectful. They all like toned it down because I was there, which was nice. But uh, what a good clinic. It was yeah. so exciting to go to level but four. But for other women listening, I mean, how difficult is it to achieve your level four? It was, it was you, you had to travel. And I also did the uh, women's hockey certification. They had that in Connecticut, New Hartford, Connecticut. So there was a, you, you have to be willing to put in the time and the money um, to pay for a, that journey. Uh, but the rewards are really, they were awesome. You know, I felt comfortable with the women. Um, we had to scrape for uh, equipment. So we pretty, I put a box in the arena and asked for used hockey equipment. I washed it all. I hit the, the ice arena, the Qantas ice arena. They, they could not do enough for me. They let me have card blank open. I, they said, you can have an apartment here if you want. <laughs> but they let me have a whole room that I could store equipment and I could funnel through as kids couldn't. They didn't have the money to, to buy the equipment. So I would, you know, get the equipment donated and give it to them. But now USA Hockey has a really good program where you could get equipment to start a kid out. But later on, it's not there. So you have to kind of scrape for it. So you could get any kid playing hockey. And, and we did uh, fundraisers um, just to to pay for kids, you know, they, they could, um, we, I had a book, this, uh, it, it was, it was a book and you could sell ads and 80% of the money they raised went to pay for their hockey. 
and 20% went to pay for the book. So a lot of kids who could not afford it were able to just by having this book published. And I could get the book published for free, you know, taking that 20% and they got their hockey, uh, you know, paid for relatively cheap. They had a relatively cheap program and, and, and they could go play. Right, so, you know, other communities out there are listening you can get creative and you can open hockey up for a lot of kids who might have that financial yeah. barrier. You just got to get a little creative, you know, put some effort into it and you can open the door for a lot of kids in your community like my sister did. I'm really proud of her for that. Right. I think what Teresa is saying too is that, you know, you, you, you uh, what she was doing and, and the whole idea about, you know, having to do all that fundraising. I think that's why the NHL really stepped in with their first steps program and really try to fill that void. So parents and communities, you know, didn't have to do all that running around yeah. and, you know, just, just getting the equipment and, and for one fee, I mean, literally kids are playing hockey for the year, right? Less than the cost of even a pair of skates at this point. So it is, a, it is an incredible program, but I wanted to go back to, to Teresa, when you said at the beginning, you know, about your experience with the first aid kits, I know one of my mentors in USA hockey, when I first got involved in the coaching education program was this guy, Joe Tremarkey down in Long Island. And, it's like one of those things that you, it's the last thing you think about. And it's the most important thing you need, you know, if you're thinking about mm -hmm. it when you need it, it's too late. Right. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, knowing, you know, that your, your uh, med kit can't have two ice packs and bandages, uh, you know, two band-aids in there. It's so important for people like you in the profession too, to mm -hmm. know and say, okay, well, we're going to review this and know that in the case of emergency, we're going to be prepared. And especially in hockey and more importantly, because of the way hockey's gone now with cross ice and with the mm -hmm. AU and kids sliding into each other and skates are up and, you know, there's literally skating around with knife blades. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, it is so important to understand that little piece from, you know, your perspective as first off as a volunteer, but just knowing from being in the profession that knowing, well, okay, well, we, there's so much more here than just, you know, making sure the kids are having a good line change making sure our, our, you know, everything's stocked. And one of the things Joe talked about too, in our new era of cell phones and everything is making sure that you actually had cell phone reception in the rink. I mean, up in Pauling where you are, you know, iconic facility, unbelievable place, Kiwanis, both facilities, you're in those places and your cell phone service maybe not be the best. And you're just going to be prepared for that kind of stuff. But I love the fact that you were proactive in, you know, knowing that you're, that you're, I was going to say student athletes, I guess at one point they were, uh, but that your athletes, you know, were protected proactively, which is great. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, if you, if anyone out there wants to think about their first aid kit, you want to buy a bag that has compartments in it. And you want to prioritize like an, an outside zipper uh, compartment, if you could find one. They're, they're, they're online, but that's where you put the stuff you're going to use right away. You want to have uh, compression bandages, huge, something that would absorb. They're, they're, they almost look like they're a big pad. You want to have that handy for bleeding. You got to stop the bleeding right away. I've had injuries where a skate blade has gone across the palm and exposed the tendon. That's an, that's an immediate injury. You want to have a huge compression bandage to put on. You want to make sure you have cling or gauze wrap. You want to have uh, banded scissors, not regular scissors. They have to be one that has a um, kind of a blunt end on it that you could cut through the the, um, the the sock. If you had to cut through the sock, you want to make sure you don't stab the child or the adult. So you'll see a bandage scissors. You want that immediately if you have to access an area and you have to cut the equipment. Um, you want to have your ice packs. You want to have, uh, you do have to have all the phone numbers of every parent and child. You know, you've got to have that because a lot of parents have their kid take a ride with another student, you know, another parent or an, and, and you don't, they're at work or something. So you gotta make sure you have an emergency contact for every kid on that ice. Um, you wanna have uh, uh, cravats, they're slings or a sling. The most injuries I saw were a separation of the AC joint. 
if the coach, the coach has to make sure that the child or the older adult, if they have the puck, you skate along the board or you skate away from the board. If you're in that danger zone of three feet next to the board and you get hit, first thing you hit is the shoulder. And I see that the day, if they're skating in that danger zone and they get hit, that AC joint, bam, it separates. And you need to put that arm into a sling. You need your ice packs on there. It's an injury that might take three, four weeks to heal. But if the coach is good and teaches them, skate along the board with that puck or skate towards the middle of the ice, don't go in the danger zone three feet from the, from the boards. You're going to see a um, lot of injuries. When and you saw a lot of it. I saw a lot of AC injuries. I did. And, and it's totally avoidable. But you have to think when you're on the ice. Um, but yeah, when, 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 yeah, concussions, yeah. Yeah. a lot of concussions. I so would they, have a pen light in right. there to test the pupil. You want a pen light. Um, ace wraps. Six inch, four inch, two inch age swap, depending on the area. Uh, if, if you see a fracture of the wrist, you could grab a magazine. You gently wrap the wrist in, in a compression ace wrap. You take an ace wrap, you gently wrap it in there. You put an ice pack in there. You take a magazine, you, you cradle the arm in a magazine, you wrap it in an ace wrap, you put that arm in a sling so it's, it's protective and off they go to the ER. Um, you have no, this to be, will be This will be, there's no doubt that I think with the time of the season, this will come out. This is the perfect time to get over to uh, CVS, right? And, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, whatever, you know, the different places and, lo and yeah, load yeah. up. No. And it's funny because I can think about all the years oh. my kids played hockey. And I know for a fact we were not equipped with all of that because when my son suffered, a, he broke his wrist. Um, we, he just held it like this until we got to the ER. There was I know, you no one helped wrap take, it or don't um, touch them, don't touch them. That's what everybody said. You said. can't be afraid. Yeah. You have to be prepared with a magazine. Yeah. Right. Simple thing, a simple sling, a yeah. simple protective device. Um, the ice arena, the Qantas ice arena, they were so good. I went and I said, do you have a first aid kit? And they showed me this wimpy little thing that you put in your car. I go, oh my God. <laughs> so they gave me carte blanche, go to the drugstore, get what you want. I made this massive, you know, first aid kit for them. And I was putting it together. When you know a kid on the ice, completely slashed the tendons on his on his hand on the palm of his hand and I was like what <laughs> off I go prepared. and away he went and if I'm going to tell the parents if you have an injury if you have a blade injury you find a specialist a hand specialist immediately you have to have that surgery done within 24 hours do not let them go tell it go to the ER and they say oh come back in a week don't do that. Go immediately to a hand surgeon. You have 24 hours to get those tendons reattached. Right. And um, I told the parents to do that. They did. The kids, total functioning of the hand. But I, I've seen where they've gone to emergent care and they say, I'll come back in a week. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll say this, continue what you're talking about, you know, being prepared is really most of the battle here you know so for the coaches out there and the parents coaches you should be making sure that the rink the rink at minimum is equipped with a lot of these uh, materials and if you have a team manager it might be smart to have somebody around that even carries them around for your team like look not to go super dark here but i do need to say this people have died in arenas because the, the arena was not prepared um, and again, it's, yeah. it's, it's not fun to talk about, but it has happened. It's one of the reasons why defibrillators are now almost in every yes. arena. They think they have They're to be in every arena. arena. Um, so, I mean, that is obviously the extreme, but there's also the injury side of these things. And again, you know, the key with injuries uh, is, is not, obviously prevention, but if something happens, Again, Teresa, as you're saying, it's knowing what to do, knowing what to have so that it doesn't get worse, right? So using the hand injury, if a tendon is exposed, again, I'm not a medical doctor or a physical therapist, but as you said, if you don't get that treated right away, you're looking at long-term damage, right? Where mm -hmm. This is where knowledge goes a long way. 
Um, I also say, and it's a groaner for a lot of coaches, but you should be walking through some of course. I know USA Hockey does a lot with this. Go find that extra information. There's extra courses you can take just to know. All right. Oh, I, there's yeah. parents yeah. on on the team that you could access. There's a lot of nurses, doctors, right? Anybody, uh, paramedics, use them. Identify but them not too. Not all dark, but it is it is a fun sport. It is right. the most hysterical <laughs> thing you ever wanted to do. You know, you know what I like is you wear that equipment and it looks like, oh my God, look at that fall. You get right back up and you're like going. I was right. like, how did they do that? I go, does it hurt? Right. I look at right. these figure skaters. Oh my God, they fall. It's like, hey, oh. easy on the figure I don't, but, but you uh, fall, that tough, hurt. Man. I'm sorry. Like I can do this tremendous tumble. I get right back. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get you. <laughs> right, right. Listen, one of the things that marks uh, ice sports is we just get back up unless we physically can't. I'll tell you guys a really funny story. So Teresa, my wife, my wife is a doctor, a medical doctor, and we were living in England. Um, now mm. England, for those of you who don't know, has a very different healthcare uh, situation than we do. They have something called NHS, the national healthcare system. So when injuries would happen over there, when I was, when I was coaching uh, professional hockey over there, when injuries would happen there, you were done for the game. Uh, if it was significant enough that you had to come off the ice, you were probably done for the game. You had to go to the hospital and it would usually take a long time, like days to weeks to get something either fixed or diagnosed. So again, it's a different situation there medically. So I remember my wife was with us for one game. Um, I can't mention any names here, but, but one of the players cut his lip. All right. And he comes to the locker room because he was bleeding quite a bit. And my wife is there and she walks in the locker room because we, we, you know, I was working there. So they invited her in uh, and she goes, I can, I can fix that for you. I can uh, maybe stitch it or glue it and get you back on the ice. And I remember him saying, what, you can do that. And she goes, yeah. And he goes, but what, should I go to the hospital? She goes, do you want to play or not? You're a hockey player. Right. <laughs> right. And the thing was, what was funny is he said, yeah, do it. But he was so shocked that someone could fix him right away and get him back. Cause he's like, that's it. I'm done for two weeks. And she did. I'm, I'm pretty sure she glued it back together. Uh, you know, hockey, but he got back out there and he didn't miss a game. But I always thought that was a funny story because I remember seeing the shock on his face. Like I can go back out there. Whereas here, <laughs> here it's, I have to go back out there. Right. Uh, but you know, that's a funny story to begin with. Right. But um, why don't you tell us a story of, I guess you said a little bit about across the hand, any other uh, crazy injury stories that you can talk about? Oh, yes. Yeah. I, oh, I got you excited about, now. Yeah. <laughs> there was this fundraiser game and I was playing defense and it was a mixed league and this guy hit me so hard threw my back out I could not stand up and my daughter she was in the in the locker room getting changed because she was playing in the next game now I taught her how to do manipulations I like back manipulations so I went I crawled into the locker room and I go Michelle fix my back and she went boom, 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 put me right back and I'm like son of my god I'm gonna get me and I went right back out there but just because she knew how to do it just fix my back I got back out there <laughs> and I did I was so mad at that guy oh the guys on the bench they were ready to attack this guy why did he hit her what's the matter with him they were so good they were ready to defend me but I fixed him boy <laughs> I went up to him and what you do that for you know but I got right back out I think you we know. just saw Coach, Coach Marzette come out a little bit there, which is awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah, Coach Marzette. I could see that one. that one got you. Go, go ahead, Mike. No, no, was, I love it. I mean, I, it's just like the competitiveness of, uh, you know, and that's what I heard about, you know, you know, doing, you know, as your, as your, you know, life up in uh, the Kiwanis Ice Arena, you know, just doing all the stuff that you're doing and the energy level. I mean, you can hear it in your voice, right? But when, when people like you that are associated with these youth programs, you know, that's the, the, the main component is not hockey background knowledge of hockey you know even the go to the coaching clinics that's great i mean obviously i'm a proponent of that but the energy and the passion that you can bring into a building is really that's what you need right because there's a lot of people that are really good hockey people but with zero passion and zero energy nothing really gets done so it's really it's really fun to hear you know as much as your resilience is to uh jump back on the ice you know after a you know injury i guess that you you would you wouldn't classify that but i think uh you know, just even knowing the stuff you've done with growing, you know, all the different activity, you know, youth programs. I mean, I, I love hearing about, you know, where, and I know Kiwanis pretty well and knowing that, you know, from where they went from, you know, such a small little group of kids to, you know, over like 150 learn to skate kids in this little tiny community, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bringing in adaptive 
sports, you know, and sled hockey and, and, and spearheading that. And, and obviously I think it's, oh, is, it yeah. the, sled is it, hockey? is it the Phillies okay. program? That's the women's program. Uh, that's the, the girls. Yeah. Girls. The, girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the oh, nightmares. The, is the, the nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah. I think all of those things you hear about, you know, you're doing when most people are like, okay, yeah, I helped uh, do the learn to skate. Yeah, but you're, you're actually, you know, involved with the whole ecosystem of, of these arenas. Oh, that sled hockey, you mentioned that's like, you know how that started? I got the high school team to play against the sled hockey team, the New York Rangers sled hockey team. They came up, they brought all these sleds to play against our high school team. So they had, they got their asses whipped. By them. <laughs> They've got their, their they got their, I'll say it in Polish. I'll say, I'll say it in Polish. Dupa. Okay, you know Dupa. I right? like the You're way you Polish. said it first, but we'll let it slide. <laughs> they got whooped by them. But that uh, the, the New York Rangers, sled, they donated a sled to my rink, to the rink I go to. And I got the Kiwanis Club, because I'm a Kiwanis member, to donate two more sleds. They're like $900 a piece. Right. And they gave me the money to buy two sleds. And I had clinics, uh, spot kids with spina bifida come and uh, learn how to do sled hockey. They were good enough to send some coaches up to teach them. So um, yeah, it was, it was just weird how they had, you said sled hockey. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And as a physical therapist in the schools for many years, she would you know help children with Spina bifida would be special well, needs. Yeah, yeah, special, special needs. needs. And you saw a lot of benefits oh. when they got out on the ice. Um, yeah. There were so many things that they can't do. This was amazing. It was fun. And it was a lot of fun. You yeah. had to think quick. You know, yeah. that, <laughs> but the, the learn to play, no, the learn to play um, hockey with those little five year olds, um, you could get these rubber buckets. The rubber buckets and you could stack them like they're like sand buckets but you stack them in a tier and you take the kid they're laying on the ice they can't skate but you lay them on the ice and you shoot them into the buckets the buckets <laughs> all fall down on them they get up they have to crawl back to you and then you say okay the next time you've got to go on your hands and knees okay okay now you got to go tall kneel you got to come back so each time they have to come back in a different way, but you just shoot them into there and the buckets <laughs> fall on them and they're so hysterical. And they, and they don't realize they're learning because they're no. having fun. <laughs> and then you tell them, okay, this time I want you, when I shoot you, I want you to roll. And they roll all the way and knock the buckets down and you have to think quick. And then they, and then pretty soon they're standing up skating. It was like, poof, yeah. you know, one, one of my <laughs> no favorite. time at all. One of my favorite changes about how hockey has been taught over the last 10, 15 years is exactly what you're talking about. I remember when the ADM came into place and all those games were in the drill book and, and a lot of coaches were upset about it. I remember that this isn't hockey, but uh, having coached uh, my son's Adams team last year, I borrowed a lot of those. I did the tennis balls on the ice and I told them to get them, put them in the bucket. They're learning how to stand up and sit down and uh, it takes the fear out of the game, right? I mean, again, for, for you young coaches out there, coaches that teach young kids, uh, the first lesson, again, if, if I may offer some advice, the first lesson I always teach kids, whether they're skating, it's, it's skating, it's hockey, it's anything skating, is the first rule is that it's okay to fall down. Uh, right. That's the first thing I always teach the kids, especially if they have pads on. And then I make them fall down and get up about 20 times and it becomes funny, Yes. right? Um, same thing, like, again, you know, you get rid of that fear early because you can't move forward if you're afraid to fall down in hockey. It's going right. to happen, no. right? And then, and then they always love it when I give the example of me falling down, which is basically me trying not to throw my back out. But, you know, it's something. <laughs> um, so I, I want to transition here. Like, it's amazing the work you've done in the game. Again, as Mike just said, it's much more than just volunteering, right? You're going the extra mile. Uh, you're making sure that the game is accessible to people that it might not be accessible to. Uh, that is what this show is absolutely all about. All of us on here do that in some way. But I did be, I would be remiss if I didn't jump into PT um, and uh, uh, making sure that we talk to the audience a little bit more about what we talked about earlier of common injuries, how we can prevent them um, in the sense of you talked about AC joints, concussions, but let's walk the, the coaches through and the parents through. Maybe these are the three or four things. If your kid's playing hockey, especially at a high level, just keep an eye out for this. Uh, whether it be preventative measures or post measures after injury, right? I'm in physical therapy right now for a shoulder injury. 
uh, and a back injury that they actually fixed, which was great. Now, now I'm very uh, superstitious about doing all the exercises they taught me every day. So it doesn't reoccur, but why don't you walk the, the, the coaches and the parents through this? And even if there's any kids listening of things they can do, and if an injury happens, what they should do, because um, I would say it's like braces, right? If you're wearing braces and you don't wear your retainer afterwards, your teeth are going to get messed up again. Right? So, so recovery is insanely important to injuries. Mm-hmm. And, and I want to make sure that, that we, we convey that through you today. Yeah. Um, all right. I did mention about the AC joint, you know, chromial clavicular joint. That's right in here. Um, if they do suffer that, one of the tests I do to see if they can go back on the ice. This is a shoulder injury, I, is it just, just for the people that are this listening. This is a shoulder. This is a shoulder okay, I'm injury. Just, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about this. When they're ready to go back on the ice, I make them take out their stick and do a hard backhand shot. If they can do a hard backhand shot without any pain, they're okay to go back on the ice. I really, I really do. I test them like that. Right. Uh, knee injuries. How many knee injuries have you seen? Um, meniscus. Uh, th- that's the little pads in between the knee. Uh, the ligaments along the side of the knee. I do. It's called a provocative test when a person child, adult, injures their knee. I make them stand on the knee, single leg stance. And I look for stability. I look up and down the back. I look to see if there's these little uh, bones in the back of the hips. Um, And I look to see if one goes up, one goes down when they stand on the leg. So that tells me that the muscle on the side of the hip is not holding the hip level. I look at the bottom of the knee and I see if it's wobbly. If it's wobbly, I might take the two bones in the knee. The femur is at the very top. The tibia is at the bottom. I'll take the tibia and I'll rotate it out and I'll take the femur and I'll rotate it in. If if I see that instability, I kind of lock it in. And if they say, oh, that feels better, I'm like, oh. I might do kinesio tape. I don't know if you know what kinesio tape is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Okay, it's at at sports tape. So there's a way that you could do, it's kind of like a barber pole. You do this taping of the the leg and on top of the kinesio tape, there's another tape called leuco tape and it sticks on top of the kinesio tape and it adds, there's a way to make, it's called the tab you put a little tab on it and you put the leuco tape over so it gives a massive neurological input right. and they're much more stable on the ice. And then I'll get them to do uh, certain exercises to improve the strength of their big butt muscle. The muscle on the side of the hip is overused. So I need to improve the strength of there's a little muscle on top of the knee called the vastus medial, medial oblique. That needs to be strengthened. That's only works between 30 degrees and zero degrees of extension. So I need to improve the strength of that. And I'm going to look at the flexibility of the hamstring. Are the hamstrings holding back the knee too tight? Um, another test I do on the knee is I might have them bend the knee. And I might put my hand along the patella, which is the kneecap. So I might just gently support the kneecap on the bottom and have them bend. They'll say, oh, that feels better or not. I might move it to the middle part of the knee, have them bend. I might have them move to the top of the knee and I just support it and see. And if they think that that um, helps them, then I know that it's called a patellar tracking disorder. So the patella is not staying. Um, The femur has these two uh, big bones and the kneecap is supposed to sit in it. So sometimes when they bend, it slips up. So I might take the kinesio tape, lay it along the side, and there's a certain way to do it where you tighten it up and then you put the the leuco tape, you put a tab on there to hold the patella in a little better. So you're you're making the knee uh, track properly so you use the muscles properly and you'll get stronger 
So these are a little provocative tests that I do. If there's a shoulder problem, sometimes I have seen shoulder dislocations and you could get instability or weakness in the shoulder. And I might have them move the shoulder up and they'll say, oh, it, I can only move it this far. And I'll take what's called the scapula and I'll support the little wing bones on the back of the scapula and make the scapula move. And if it does, there's a certain way to put the kinesio tape to allow that arm to move better. And then I will have used, I'll use like, um, I don't know if you know that stretchy TheraBand. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so then I'll, I'll have them do certain exercises to strengthen, it's called the subscapular muscle and the rotator cuff muscle. I'll test to see what muscles are weak um, and then put them on an exercise program for that. Uh, hand and wrist injuries, um, I'll take them through a range of motion test. Um, if I see that they're having pain, there's a, a device called a gaucho and it's a, a, an instrument driven massage tool. It looks like a butter knife. It, they're, they're all different size. They're, have you ever seen them? They're metal yeah. heavy. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar so, with all this, but yeah. Okay. Like, so yeah. if they're having pain, <laughs> I might use the gaucho in, in the entire area of the joint. Up, if it's the leg, I might use the whole leg. I'll have them move as I do this. You know, it um, feels like a knife too when you're using it. Yeah. it well, it shouldn't. It, it, it no, I know. It's like a scrape, though. I, it's, 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 it, it shouldn't yeah. hurt. It's yeah. supposed to just um, calm the area down right, and right. balance out because sometimes you have muscles that work too much and or nerves that are too much uh, innervated and other right. ones that aren't. And this balances out. And if they tell me they have a 50% reduction in pain, then I might add a kinesio tape on top of that. Right. So it just adds to it. But, but there's a lot you could always, right. you know, you could go to a physical therapist if you need, I'm not that I'm promoting it, PT or chiropractor. And um, if, it, if it's not a a, a injury that needs surgical intervention. I mean, if like in the knee, you have to find out if the meniscus is torn. If right. you have a torn meniscus and it's flopping back and forth, then no exercise is going to fix that. No, that surgical. needs to be surgically yeah. a surgical intervention in that. And that you'll find out it locks, the, the knee locks, and then sometimes it doesn't. So you know you have a loose body in there. But so, you know, so many kids, especially the girls yeah. playing lacrosse, we've seen right. a lot of meniscus tears. Um, so we yes. have also suffered that. So yeah, because um, their hips are out yeah. too far. So you have too much of an angle of the knee and that sets you up for uh, meniscus or, uh, or yeah. ligament. Young damage. girls really need to be aware of that. Um, right. But I, I think it's great that physical therapy is an option if you don't need surgery, though. So that's right. something that our, our listeners should really, you know, pay attention to. You know, listen to your body. Yeah, I mean, that's something that's happening with me right now. So real quick, so Teresa, you're proving two things right now. It's that uh, whenever you listen to our kids play hockey, you should be bringing a pad of paper and a pen to take notes. Uh, the other <laughs> thing, too, is if you don't want to do that, make sure you have a good physical therapist on your team that knows everything that she's yeah. talking about, right? <laughs> Uh, no, you know, you know, it's funny is a lot of the stuff you're talking about now didn't exist when I was playing as a young kid. Um, no. and the, and the, the tapes are unbelievable what they're able to do. Uh, and some of these, uh, I said, I should say advancements uh, in the field have been incredible. Um, you know, again, a quick story that then I have a, a, a pretty big question for you. Actually, I think that our audience will appreciate but um, I tore my labrum when I was 17. Uh, I, I was after my, my shoulder popping out five times. I had to get, I've told this story before on the show, so I'm not going to go deeply into it, but I had to have surgery when I was 17, my senior year of high school. Now, um, I don't know if anybody knows this, but my, my labrum on the same shoulder is now torn again. All right. Uh, a, a, a byproduct of carrying two young children around for the last seven years of my life. Um, but I'm in a position where it does need surgery, but it's not, I don't need it immediately. So I'm in now in physical therapy and they have, they have strengthened my shoulder my range of motion is much better to the point of, I, I do believe one day I will get the surgery, keeping in mind that we just got out of a pandemic. I didn't want to be in a hospital. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. 
but they've really done things to it that I didn't think were possible. Uh, I do not have the full range of motion, but it is probably 80% better than it was uh, when I went in. So it, it's one of those things you have to gauge, keeping in mind too, that, that I am not a youth hockey player anymore. I am a, a father of two. I won't say my age on the air, but my point is, is that, you know, depending on where you're at in your life, you, you have to make those decisions. Now, here's a really important question, all right, for youth hockey players in particular. We all grow up watching the NHL and we'll see the guys in the Stanley Cup final play through torn everything, destroyed shoulders, used to play through concussions. They don't do that too much anymore, but these major, major injuries. And we grow up with the mentality of whatever it is, we play through it. Okay. And the truth is this, if you're under 18, you're not in a position probably <coughs> making that call wisely. That's why your parents are so important. So Teresa, the question I have for you is there is a big difference between an injury where you can go back and play without the fear of injuring it further and an injury where you want to go back to play, but you could really seriously injure yourself, right? Long-term. Uh, my belief is that if a doctor, a physical therapist, a nurse, or any medical professional says to, I'll say my son or my daughter, if you go back out there, you are risking serious injury. I will tell them you cannot go back out there. All right. If they say to me, it's going to hurt, but you can play, obviously they can go and play. Can you talk about specifically for the coaches and the parents, that situation, what you should probably be telling your kids and when you have to put your pride aside as a parent and say, you need to sit down, right? Because again, I can see the scenario right now. It's a championship or a playoff game. Your kids, one of the top kids on the team, something happens to their knee or their shoulder uh, and it's a big risk it's just not worth risking the long-term injury. That's what being part of a team is all about anyway. Right. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that and, and advice for the parents and the coaches out there when these situations arise. You know what the worst one, a kid with a concussion, right? That's right. the worst one that parents say he's all right. He's got a hard head. He can go back out. If you have repetitive stress injuries, right? You're not. You're, you're talking permanent brain damage, right? You know, your head is like a moving very loosely in the skull and you could just fall very hardly on the ice and, and you could get a concussion because your brain, your brain floats. Um, that's the hardest one, I think, because you can't see the injury when it's outside of the body. I can show them how unstable that joint is. I can show them. I can't show them the inside right. of a brain. I can't do that. They're the hardest patients to say, your kid really shouldn't play. Right. You know, it's we've, too much of a risk. We've had cases that I can recall one case where uh, it was a goalie, goalie's parents. She had three concussions probably had a fourth and they shopped around for a doctor until they found a doctor because yeah. they yeah. weren't going to let her back out on the ice unless she had the doctor's approval. And she shopped around to find a doctor that gave her approval. Is that really worth it? That is, is, that, you know, is that parenting? I mean, like, like, what does that say about you as a parent well, too? I mean, that, they yeah. wanted her to be seen yeah, and, <laughs> by and, scouts. And, well, <laughs> and that was more important than her head. Yeah, it, it freaks me out when that pride comes ahead of, of protecting their kids. And like, look, I, look, I understand the pride. I mean, I, I'm a parent. Mm -hmm. I, I get it. We all do. Everybody on the show gets that. But you got to think ahead of long-term brain damage. You know, it, when I was a kid, and this is really true for you, Mike, and, and all of us, right? You know, a concussion was a day-to-day. -day. Okay, get back, get back up. You bumped your head. Um, it was really Sidney Crosby, to, to, <laughs> to the disappointment of many, that changed this in hockey when he sat out an entire year with, with a pretty serious concussion, right? Uh, but he sat out for an entire year and basically said, this is my brain. Right. And I think, I think Mike, I'd love your thoughts on this too. I think that really changed the conversation in hockey that, wow, if Sidney Crosby is going to sit out an entire year, um, maybe we should rethink this. And then obviously the NFL and CTE uh, put this to an, another level, but uh, yeah, concussions. I mean, it's medically proven now beyond, beyond a doubt that even a minor concussion, you need to sit, you need to let your brain rest for an extended period mm -hmm. of time. Or I'm going to say this again, you are risking, long-term brain injury for your child, right? And, and, and by the way, when you're concussed, you're not in a position to make the call to go back out there. I have been concussed and I have gone back out there. I look back at it now 
going, what, what I, well, I wasn't thinking because my brain wasn't working correctly. Mm -hmm. Mike, obviously uh, at your level of coaching too, and Teresa, that doesn't take anything away from yours, but Mike, you've experienced this a lot uh, as this transitioned in your coaching years, haven't you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's still a stigma though for athletes, right? That you're not tough. If you yeah. can't, if you, if you can't play through any injury, shoulder, arm, leg. And I, and I, listen, I, I, I'm as guilty of it as anybody, probably not with concussions because I just feel like I've been, I put myself in a, in a situation to be as educated as possible outside of being, you know, a medical professional about what the effects of multi, you know, not even knowing you have a concussion, just head injuries over and over and over and over again. And the way you, you know, treat your body, uh, you know, is one thing, but your head is, uh, you know, like I said, you could, you could get labrum surgery, you can have knee surgery, you can get hand surgery. There's not a lot you can do uh, once your brain's damaged uh, to, to, you know, in the, in the concussion world. But I think it's, it's, it's really more you know, having people like Teresa on and the educational side for parents. We, it's, it is a, it's not that you're not tough enough, uh, but certainly I think, you know, for somebody like Sidney Crosby, maybe it's easier for him to sit out because he doesn't have as much on the line as a kid that's thinking, oh, the minute I'm out, I'm never getting back in. Or if I don't show that I can, you know, if I tell somebody about this, it, it devalues right. me in, a, in, in, in some way. So it is hard. And I think the higher levels you get, uh, you, you, now the problem is, right, we all think our kids are at high levels. We, we think <laughs> nine-year-olds are a high level. So like, oh my God, if he, my nine-year-old misses this opportunity, it's going to affect their career. I'm like, well, there is no career. You're nine. <laughs> Um, right. but, but as what are you the, talking about, Mike? What do you mean? I know, I know, I know, I know. I've, got, I've got to get, I've got to get on that, I've got to get on that plane and go to Chicago. I have to do it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of what, but, but I do, I can see as you get higher and higher and higher and you get into college and, and the OHL and, and you get into, you know, NCAA and, and, and minor pro, it becomes harder and harder to admit when you're injured because the time you sit out could affect the future of your game. I, right. I, I get that. Uh, but we're, we're talking to parents here of children and it's your obligation, your duty to say, no, no, you're injured. You're sitting out. We are all on the same team. And, and I'll tell you on, on the, on the coaching side, it's the coach could be the strongest advocate for this because mm -hmm. if the coach just says, yeah, you could play, you're going to sit on the bench right next to me. Okay. You're cleared. I get it. I'm not taking it. I do that. I, I've done that multiple times where I've gotten a lot of flack for it. Where I've just said, okay, I get it, but you're sitting right. I know mom and dad said you're okay, but you're going to sit next to me for the game. That's it. Right. And and it takes the right pressure, as a coach too. Takes the pressure sure. off the kid. Yeah, that's your right as a coach to do that. And uh, you know, again, you might take flack for it later, but you no, there's no doubt about it. But and maybe yeah. I'm maybe I'm wrong. But let's hope let's hope I am. Uh, you know, here, here's a here's a here's a conversation for all of us, right? Things I don't see. Again, I'm a younger coach in terms of children. I've only coached adults and college hockey players. But here's something I don't see in youth hockey is parents and coaches saying to the kids, by and large, if you are injured, do not be afraid to tell me that you're injured. Or if you're hurt, do not be afraid. I will not think any less of you. Like we don't say that to these kids a lot of times. And that's again, Mike, again, don't get me wrong. There's strong willed people everywhere. Uh, I remember being a hockey player as a kid and feeling invincible. I remember it. There was no injury that could stop me, right? Until there was. But I, I remember that feeling. Right? It, it's impossible for a young player or a teenager to not feel that way. That's just part of growing up. But uh, I remember having conversations with my father about this. And, and, and again, I think this would be different now. I used to tell him, if I don't get up, I'm really hurt. Because my mentality was, if I can move my legs, I'm going to get off the ice, right? And it was actually a shoulder injury that kept me down, right? So but I always felt safe, right? I never thought they would put me in harm's way. It's just a conversation, a coach and a player. I don't want you to be afraid to tell me that you're injured, right? I won't think any less of you. I'm not saying you should say, I'll put you back on the ice or I'll do this. Don't promise them anything, but just let them know. No one's going to think any less of you if you get hurt and you can't play. But just, just so you know, too, I think in our audience, there's a huge swath of the, of the still of the athletic world right? that thinks kids – would use that in the, in the, in the, in the worst way. Like it, it, they right. think, Oh, well, this kid's just, he's using this excuse to get out of this. And you can't present right. that message. Right. It is. It, I, I see, I hear it every, all the time. Like, Oh, he's a little soft or she just doesn't, she just doesn't want it bad enough. I'm like, well, that's, and I think that goes to, back to your original question with Teresa is, is it pain 
or is it an injury? Like, right. is it, is it are, did you get a, did you get whacked in the arm and, you know, somebody slashed you yeah. and you're like, oh, that really hurt. Okay. Well, yeah, it's going to hurt. It's you're playing athletics. It's, it hurts. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not, you know, I fell off my bike that hurt. Oh, my right. knee. Well, your knee is still intact and okay. We're going to scrape a little bit of the, the asphalt out of there. Right. And <laughs> I do with my kids all the time because you don't want them to be like, oh, I, I'm giving up that, that was, that was, I, 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 I got, I got hurt. Yeah. You got hurt. Let's get up. You're not injured. Right. And we could get by this, but I think, you know, yeah. when we keep going and I think Teresa, you're, you said it, it's so hard from the concussion side because there yeah. is no visual. Like there's no, like your, your, your brain, you know, you're, you're not cut open and you're just injured. You're, you're inside, you're hurt. If I hurt my elbow, I can assess, oh yeah, that's not, that's pretty bad. Let's go to the hospital. You know what I mean? Like you can mm-hmm. see it. And I think that's such a hard thing for all of us as parents. Mm-hmm. You're like, okay, do you brush it off? And you say, Hey, you, you, you know, kiss the boo-boo to my five-year-old and get back out there. Or do you sit them out and put them in a bubble? I, I struggle with that all the time. Right. Right. And Mike, I'll just say, well, follow up. Cause I agree with you. I, I think what I'm saying about telling the kids that is that, so you get to make the gauge on whether it is just pain or an injury. Right. Cause I'm a big believer of, look, if it hurts, but you're not injured. Yeah. You, you get back out there. That's, that's a life lesson right there. Right. Uh, and again, the question I always asked was, can I get hurt worse if I play with it? Right. Yeah. Assuming it's not something major. Um, if the answer was yes to that, I always went back out. I'm sorry. If the answer was no to that, I always went back <laughs> on the ice. Yeah. No, if the answer was yes. I, I, I wanted to go back in the ice, but I thought about it, but anyway, t- uh, Teresa, Christy, we should let you share your thoughts on this as well. Go ahead. Chris. I mean, I've had occasions where, you know, my kids would say, I really, you know, I didn't tell you this afterwards after the game, but my wrist really hurts. And then we go and get it checked out. We find out whether or not it's just, you know, a bad bruise or if there's something serious going on. But it is hard to get your kids to tell you that because they want to play. So they, I want them to feel comfortable telling me before the game and then we can assess it <laughs> rather than afterwards. So it, that is a tricky thing right. because yes, you want your kids to be tough and you want them to go out there and, and play. And if, they just have, you know, a couple of scrapes or bruises and maybe, you know, maybe their stomach hurts a little bit, play through it. But then if it's something serious, you have to, you have to make sure that they stay off the ice so it doesn't progress. Right. But a right. lot, my kids would never tell me before they went to game if something bothered them. And that always bothered me because I wanted to have the opportunity to assess before and not after. Let, so let me, if there's let, let a way you can get quick. your kids to share that with you. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. not under any assumption that my kid's going to tell me he's hurt if he wants to play, but, but I'm, I'm right. like, it's, it's what happens throughout the course of the injury. So like, like, let me, let me give another metaphor. Maybe this will explain what I was saying better. Um, it's like drinking, right? Uh, I've heard, I, I think this is really great advice that I got. They said, you know, when your kids are, are teenagers and alcohol comes into the equation, right. Or they're aware of it. You know, he said, tell your kids that if, if you do something stupid and go out, if you're drunk, just call me, don't drive home. I won't be mad at you. I won't say anything. That's how I look at this. You know, I, I'm not expecting them to tell me they're going to go do something if they're hurt, but it's that, that conversation afterwards. Of, I don't want them to ever be afraid to come to me if they need me for anything. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm, a, I'm the youngest hockey parent here, so I could be, I could be wrong on this. But uh, yeah, Christy, I, I'm, under, I'm not under any illusion that my kids are going to come up to me and be like, hey, my wrist hurts. I can't play today. Like, you know what I mean? But it's, I want yeah, them to- It doesn't happen. Yeah. My, my kids had trouble with that because my husband, Gerard, is a pharmacist. And me being a physical therapist, I'm constant. we were constantly looking at him, evaluating him. You're not walking right. You're not holding it right. <laughs> right. You gotta, and it right away- They're gonna know. Kids, my nieces yeah. and nephew called me Aunt Pokey because <laughs> as soon as they were born, I was doing like all these motor tests on them constantly. Always saying, poking them. I was, I was always, I was Aunt Pokey. But my kids, they're like, oh, mom, I can't get away with anything with you. I go, no, you can't, you know? <laughs> but but it, it, it's tough when you have that knowledge of what's right. And my husband being a pharmacist, he's like, well, that's swollen. You need an anti-inflammatory right now. And he'd spill out all this stuff. <laughs> so, you know, he, we had our kids covered, you know? Right. They couldn't get away with anything. What but, advice would you give to Graham? I mean, when do you know when it's okay for them to go out and when should you hold oh, them back? Yeah, I, 
you know, you need to be trained. You really have to go to a specialist that could tell you, yes, your kid is ready. And they have to know if, if it's hockey, you want them to go back, but they have to know the sport, um, like groin injuries. Right. When is it right for a kid to go back? How many groin injuries have you guys seen? Uh, a lot? Uh, enough. Yeah. You've experienced <laughs> it? Absolutely. Yeah. I've had a few of So those. I'm going to test you and I'm going to, there's a real simple thing you could do. Um, you have a, a slippery floor and you put um, either sliders, you know, those sliders to move furniture, or you could take two towels and you put them underneath their knees and you make them slide out as far as they can go. And you assess the range of motion. If one's going out farther than another, you know, like, you're not ready yet. Um, so that's an easy test. Uh, you, you always do a provocative test. You put the the extremity in a position of stress and then you see what way relieves the stress right um like i'll i'll put them through that they have to be able to bring that leg all the way back i'm going to look at do they have full range of motion to totally extend that leg and then i'll test the glute muscle i'll i'll physically give it a, a, a resistance to see and compare it right left i'm always comparing right and left I'm looking for balance. I'm looking at the back. I'm looking at the shoulder. Um, I've seen clavicle. Have you seen fractured clavicles at all? Mm -hmm. And you, you have seen that. Okay, so you're going to have a little dip in here. You have a big bubble. That's how it heals. You, you have a big bubble. Well, I'm going to look and see, you know, if the shoulder has full range of motion that they can go through and shoot that puck in all different positions. Can they go do the Superman slide on the right. ice? I want to see if they can do that. And if they're like, eh, like this, I'm like, eh. Teresa, can I, 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 have, I, have a, I have a quick question. Cause I mean, just like all of our episodes, this seems to, this, this, we could add nine here. So <laughs> if, if, if you're so from your point of view, from, a, from, you know, physical therapist and from somebody that has to evaluate these injuries after the fact, what can we do as hockey parents to be proactively, like you're, you're talking about, you know, assessing range of motion and proprioception and you know, the ability, Heat. right? Yeah. So all of these things. So, I mean, from my point of view, I mean, from my side of like the hockey world, right? I, I, I would ask a kid, I'd rather do gymnastics and movement clinics way over a power skating clinic, you know, in their early development. Because I think what happens is, you know, because we're not taking care of those areas that are going to be injured ahead of time. And then we're just going to, try to fix them but what would you suggest you know youth specifically hockey parents in this case you know what are some things they can do proactively to make sure all these kind of range of motion and we can reduce groin injuries and hamstring injuries and hip flexion issues i mean is it just all right not the being first thing, you first thing you have to look at how sedentary your child is are they spending a long time in front of the TV computer on the phone. They have to be outside at the playground using that playground equipment. Um, I, my kids, we went hiking, biking. We did everything. And <laughs> I know my son was telling his girlfriend, he never went to an amusement park before. <laughs> And he, he went on a Ferris wheel for the first time. Oh my God, my parents never did this. We didn't. We we were in the mountains the whole time. Um, but you right, but I guess, I guess what I'm, guess what I'm saying, I guess what I'm saying though, so I'm hearing that, you know, the, the, the getting off the couch after seven hours and going to a power skating clinic is not going to be, true. is not going to help you because there's no pr preventive uh, part no. of that, that pre-activity. Right. You have to see what your kids are doing you know are they outside with their friends are they enjoying themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. you know that's what i did i i just my kids well we lived in Socrates. it's very rural so they're and we only had antenna tv so they were, we were very rustic so they were like this is terrible mom so they just went outside and they did crazy stuff outside you know imaginative stuff and we went on these crazy vacations. <laughs> yeah. 
then probably yeah, so, probably I mean, you got to enjoy being outside. You gotta get them off their phones. They're constantly texting. They're constantly in front of those video games. You need to get them outside playing. Just, just, just to be normal. Playing. Normal. Yeah. You know? I mean, That's going to you know, keep them in better shape for hockey, for any sport. But let's, let's be honest. In the hockey space now, outside, inside, there's plenty of tools and uh, things you can do right now to stay active all the time. So like, even if it's raining outside, there's no excuse, right? But staying mm-hmm. active, you know, Teresa, what's funny is you mentioned groin injuries before uh, something I remember about any, any kind of injury like that, or a muscle injury was, I, w- mm-hmm. I remember always thinking uh, maybe it'll magically be better tomorrow. And it never was, you know, the, the, <laughs> the trick is it just, it takes time. Those injuries take time. And, you know, uh, I, I've had more than one time where I've pulled a groin or a hamstring and I, I go back just a little bit too early. Maybe there's little to no pain and it, it happens again right away. Cause it wasn't mm-hmm. ready yet. Um, yep. and, and, you know, it, again, that's, that's very tough. That's very tough for a kid. I mean, you right? have to let your kids do other sports other than hockey. Totally. totally if, did true. you ever hear of skidoring? No. Did you ever hear? Okay. We had, she knows, we had huskies and malamutes for dogs and you attach a harness to your pelvis. You attach a harness to the dog and you're on cross country skis and they pull you. So my kids, to keep up with us, we hooked our dogs to them. <laughs> they pulled. They were, but we were leading and the dogs were behind and they're just going, sometimes the dogs would go off track. That was a little rough, that got a little rough, but that's a Canadian sport. Did you ever, never heard of skidoring? No, no actually, oh now, now you're mentioning it. It's so it's much fun. Good. But yeah, no, I'll send you a video of me doing it. It's hysterical. Yes, and we need our entire audience to partake in that as well, please. So, (laughs) but those kind of things, you know, move. I love, we love cross country skiing. That was one of the best sports. And then you do uh, skating on skis. Have you ever done? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's exactly what you do in hockey, you know, and uh, that stretches the tissues out. But you have to think, you know, a variety of sports. What's going to help? You know? Yeah, we talk about it's a common theme on the show that being a multi-sport athlete is is insanely yes. important. And that most professional athletes played. I'm, I'm, I really have rarely seen a professional athlete that didn't play multiple sports. And most professional athletes' parents were could be drafted by two different sports. There's plenty of NHL players that were drafted into the MLB and football players that were trying to be brought into the MLB. I mean, an athlete is an athlete. It's not just one sport. Right? Mm-hmm. I think it's important to note here. Uh, so we're getting close to the end of the episode. I want to make sure that Christy, you and Mike, if you have any other questions, now is the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're really inspirational. I mean, she is the reason why our family got into hockey. It is, you um, know, it's so funny. Yeah, it, it is, is so funny, you know. <laughs> and um, so I, I owe you a huge debt because well, it, I owe it changed my, my life. That little girl, Megan. Megan yeah. was amazing yeah. getting my daughter to play. And my son, then you, and blah, yeah. blah, blah. Then we it came a book. We didn't get into too much of, but she also organized a women's hockey team called the oh, Nightmares. Yeah, um, you can tell us so about that, please. Yeah. Yeah. Just oh, a little, little bit. It, about I, well, I did. I, put, yeah, I, I started the mom's hockey in March at the Kiwanis Ice Arena because all the kids left to play their spring sports so I could get a high value time. Uh, like 7 30 was perfect for a mom to play hockey because the kids are fed they're all done they could leave their family for an hour and come to the arena and go back home and get them to bed it was just the perfect time so um, I got two times a week to play mom's hockey I made it extremely cheap my my friend I have this really good friend Johnny Mullen he gave me um, a scholarship to purchase the ice. So I, the women had to pay $5 to get on the ice a week. It was so economically easy. Um, but it was, it was just because of my friend, um, got me to, he bought the ice for me. So I got it for a whole month and I did that for three years in a row. And then finally the women were like, we want to have a team. I go, oh, all right. So we started going once a week. And then we ended up going to a tournament called Stick It to Brain Tumors in, um, I think it was Rensselaer, Albany Rensselaer, the rink up there. And we won. <laughs> I couldn't believe we won. I go, holy cow, we won. <laughs> we were like, I can't believe it. We're so 
came to the locker room totally in shock. It's like, how could we have done that? And then it just yeah. evolved but from there. I love the stories that you share with the women who felt camaraderie and yeah. some of, one of them was going through a divorce. Oh, and, yeah. And yeah. This, it just it gave her, her, it saved her. Yeah. It, saved it saved her. her. Yeah. <laughs> you know? She had something to talk about because her kid played hockey. So now she played, now she understood the yeah. sport. And they could have a language. They could have, they could have an actual conversation. Right. So if there are other moms out there listening, um, you know, this this is something that you can do too. My my sister did it. It wasn't terribly easy, no. but if you're determined, you can find a way to do it. And uh, <laughs> if you know, it might be something that is, you know, something. It's your own every week. It's your thing. You know. I know. And, and you can relate to your kids and I mean, you have, have a little <laughs> deeper appreciation for what they do. If, you know, if you're teaching women how to skate for their first time, they feel awkward, but it's okay. I mean, as a coach, you have to be willing to get down on your hands and knees, grab their skates, pull it towards you. <laughs> this is how you have to stop. <laughs> and, you go, rrr, 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 and then you make them practice. No, you get picked out again. And then you keep making them do that. I mean, you have to just physically get down low. And then eventually they stop and they're so shocked. They're like, oh, I did it. And they're so happy. And then you teach them to shoot a puck. Okay, now you have to look. You have to look. Your stick has to follow it. You, you have to follow. Look at that. And you and then they're like, oh, I did it. I'm like, yes, you did. How yeah. about this? And then you think they're all like, they're all that, you know. They yeah. talk to their kids Teresa, like they're NHL players. I mean, I, I do so not funny. I do not know how your students deal with how boring that you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? uh, there's just no excitement no it, it, you you sound like a fantastic coach uh, i can tell that just <laughs> i did uh, pediatric pt for a long time so it's like Lou, you have to be like this all the time my husband goes can you just turn it down no, no, no that, that enthusiasm is infectious i'll put it that way we oh, need no. like he's you. like when are you up at 5 30 morning singing down scooby do down down for the dogs i get my dogs <laughs> that's, that's who you are yeah i'll tell you this too just on the team that you created you know uh, i've worked with several organizations uh, that use hockey as a vehicle for psychological needs and, and and whether it be veterans or you know women or someone going through a divorce whatever uh, psychologically, it's been proven that we need to be in groups. We need to be on teams. Uh, the human beings are not meant to, to be alone. Just not even as an yeah. introvert, you're meant to work with other people and be part of something that's striving towards something. So I applaud you for doing that. And, uh, you know, you would have won whether you won that tournament or not, if you don't. Know <laughs> well, you know, I had such nice support at the Kiwanis Ice Arena. The director there, Robbie Kleeman, you know, Robbie, right? No, um, I, I, I he he friends, just yeah. let me do anything. Well, he uh, Sean Bodie. Um, we're friends. We're, we have a mutual friend, and uh, Sean Bodie and Robbie Kleeman. They just gave me yeah, do whatever you want. Sometimes they would give me the ice for free. They wow. would give it to me for free. That's a I was gift. like, oh, that's yeah. nice. Thank you. It's Jeez. nice to see that kind of support. <laughs> yeah, obviously, very, very they funny. saw the benefits and right. what it was how it was helping you know, people who needed to. Oh, they just shook their head at me when I was out there. They're like, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> I had um, the most ridiculous drills. <laughs> that's okay. Listen, now you get to shake your head back and anybody doesn't believe, right? Again, <laughs> uh, you guys are both trailblazers in your own right. Mike, any final thoughts before we, we end this? No, as always, uh, learned a lot today. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's great to see, you know, I think everybody in these little hockey communities, uh, you know, have to have people like you, Teresa, or else they don't succeed. I mean, you can have great managers and hockey directors and people like that. But, you know, if you don't have the people that are going to get on their hands and knees, showing somebody how to stop right, and recruiting players to come out, no matter what, you know, and finding the ways to get ice and get equipment yeah. and get sleds. You got to make it fun or they yeah, lose and, and interest. I, I'm sure the audience, you know, people that listen to us and, and people that we talk to every day just outside of this, uh, it's always like, oh, yeah, I wish I had that, or I wish we did this, or I wish we did this whole, oh, yeah, well, here's living proof that you just do it. Just find somebody in your community, and people can find ways to, you know, use their passion, which obviously, you know, hockey is one of those things, uh, you know, to help all these other people, and, and countless, I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure you could go down the list, but there's countless people you've helped 
throughout your you know time through Pauling and Kiwanis that you know don't even realize probably what you did uh, in the background of things. So it's great, and I, we, certainly I applaud you, and I think it's great for for hockey. And I love the fact that you've done your level four. You're going to do your level five. I don't know that you have to write a thesis for that. You got to go down to Washington, don't you? Oh, now Minnesota this year. So you can go to Minnesota. Oh, Minnesota. Hockey, hockey oh, uh, wow. country there. So that's a long here. trip. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Maybe, maybe I will. I, I, right. uh, when it goes back to Washington, that's at least yeah, yeah, back on the East visit. Coast. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Then I could drive to, you know. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Teresa, I got to be honest with you. It's been awesome having you on the show. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love I love this much energy in the morning. I hope our audience does too. And uh, no, we'll have to have you back. I remember the conversation we were talking about. Does anybody know a physical therapist? And, and Chris, you want me back? I know one. Well, I do. Yeah, I can't speak to you. That's not my co-host. I mean, I, I'm going to guess that your sister likes you. I mean, that's why you're on today. But no, yeah. Yeah, you you were a wonderful guest. And again, to the audience, I hope that you learned a lot today. Uh, you know, this might be one you want to go back and, and review and uh, make sure that you, you you take the information that Teresa talked about because it's very important stuff. Uh, this is uh, as as fun as this show is, and as funny as we think we are, uh, it's no joking matter when it comes down to injuries, right? And uh, you were a no, guest. No, no. So thank you. You can never get away with an injury with me on the team. Right. <laughs> you can never get away. Right. Find that know. person, <laughs> coaches. Find that person that they can't get away with it. So I'm that's... gonna know. <laughs> you can't hide it from me. <laughs> That's going to do it for this edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Uh, thanks so much to Teresa Marzek for being on here. For Christy Casciano Burns and Mike Benoit, I'm Lee Elias. Make sure you check out all of our episodes on OurKidsPlayHockey.com or just search through your favorite podcast provider. We're there. That's it for this one, guys. Have a great one. We'll see you on the next episode. Take care. Bye. <laughs>